past few weeks and for a couple of weeks yet to come, we've been reading in the early chapters of the book of Acts to observe the earliest Christians who gathered together as the church and in their example to see if we might learn some lessons about how we live more fruitfully, faithfully, effectively as the church together in 2021. Today I'd like to read from Acts chapter 2 verses 43 through 47 and simply as a reminder, this comes at the very end of the chapter in which God gives the gift of the Holy Spirit to those first apostles and to those who are gathered around who are able to hear the good news in their own languages as the apostles um, speak. We'll read it again from Acts chapter 2, verses 43 through 47. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were to, together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. And with gratitude, both for those faithful and for the opportunity to hear their story, we lift up our hearts to God. I want to preface this story by telling you that this college friend of mine, now in 2021, is a leader in his community. He's a leader in his church. He is a fine and upstanding example to so many people where he lives. But in college, he was kind of a jerk. During my four years at Emory and Henry College, I lived three of them in a dormitory that was a converted farmhouse. It had space for 16 students in upstairs and downstairs. And so over the three years that I lived there, several of my classmates were there during that same time, and we got to know each other pretty well. One of my classmates, the one I'm describing, was perhaps the least sensitive of all 16 of us. And if he were here in this gathering today, he might qualify as the least sensitive in a crowd this size. He was the least sentimental. He was the most cynical, the most sarcastic, the most suspicious of human nature. In fact, lots of times his natural position, posture, and facial expression was this. So one night, we were gathered in the living room of the old house, which was our common area, and we we're watching TV together, and he walked in the room and plopped on the couch with a frown on his face. <sighs> he sighed really big, and then he did it a couple of more times, and finally, one of our other friends said, what is wrong with you? And he said, love will make you do strange things. I just spent the last hour of my life, an hour I'll never get back, watching Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. <laughs> now clearly, his girlfriend was more of the sentimental type. And because it was more important to him to share time with her, to be in her company, to enjoy her presence, he was able to put aside his distaste for a show as sentimental as Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, to be in her presence. And on his part, that required some things. It required will. It required intentionality. It probably even required some self-discipline. In this passage that we've just shared, we're tempted to ride the wave of excitement and emotion from the Pentecost sermon right into this last paragraph of Acts chapter 2. But in this paragraph, Luke, the gospel writer who also writes the book of Acts, is describing for us the day by day in which the people of the early church lived after that Pentecost experience. Now, I want to acknowledge that as we read this passage, probably the one part that catches our attention the most and that causes us to become dismissive of this paragraph, causes us to believe that this paragraph is unrealistic and that Luke might even be describing things in more glowing terms than they actually happened, 
is verse 45, the one in which the people sell their possessions and give to those who have need as the need arises. That's the one place where I think it's the most difficult for a Western culture, American church in 2021 to embrace the example of the early church. And I'd like to ask us to acknowledge that that's probably a cultural phenomenon. It's because we live in a culture that so highly values the opportunity of the individual to accomplish, to achieve, and even to accumulate. It's because we live in a society that is capitalist and urges us to earn and to save and to invest all the things that we celebrated in our offering prayer just a moment ago that we look at this and think, how unrealistic is it that we would ever find a church in 2021 that would gather together and hold all of our possessions in common? And again, we're not trying to imitate the early church. We're trying to learn from their example ways in which we might live faithfully and effectively in 2021. And I hope that we won't allow our misgivings or our doubts about that living together collectively with all of our possessions shared to prevent us from hearing the rest that this passage has to offer. Because the preceding verse, verse 44, is a remarkable verse. I'd like to read it for us again. All who believed were together and had all things in common. Now I know that because verse 45 follows, and we talk about pooling their possessions and selling them and distributing the proceeds, that when we hear all things in common, our minds immediately think about all things. Material goods, possessions, even our most prized possessions. But the interesting thing is that in this passage, in that verse, Luke is using a pretty well-known phrase in the Greek language around the Mediterranean basin in the first century. Panta koina. And it means everything in common. In the same way that you and I would say a lot in common. You know that we use that phrase mostly in relationships. And we're not usually talking about possessions. When we say that two people have a lot in common, we're usually not thinking, you know, I think they have the same sofa and kitchen knife set. We're usually thinking about their attitudes, their personalities. We're talking about their mindsets and their approaches to different parts of life. I know that was the case when the two people who encouraged me to call Suzanne Kinder in 1997 they said to me, you all have a lot in common. And what they were talking about were things like our faith, things like our interests, things like our background. And so Suzanne and I went on that date and we discovered for ourselves that we have a lot of things in common. And that's what drew us to each other. And the same thing happens as we introduce people, not merely to become potential life partners, but as we introduce people that we think might be good friends or as we introduce people here in church and are just trying to give them the opportunity to find common ground with each other, we'll say, you all have a lot in common. And we're talking about attributes and traits. We're not talking about tangible things. And that's what's remarkable about this passage for me. Panta koina. They held all things in common. And notice that. The verb that Luke uses here is not merely had. Because Suzanne and I had those things in common. But it was not anything that we willed together. She had those interests because of the context in which she was raised. She had those interests because of the ways in which God wired her when she was being formed in her mother's womb. I had those attributes and traits because of the ways that God made me. And because of the ways that my community and my home and my parents shaped me. But the verb that Luke uses in this passage is the Greek verb, verb echo, which means held. The early church held all things in common. And held is a verb that requires the kinds of things that I described about my friend a moment ago. To hold things requires intentionality, an act of will. It requires some self-discipline from time to time, doesn't it? 
Suzanne and I are described in a variety of ways now as husband and wife. There's one major category of our lives in which we are uh, classified as married filing jointly. And that means that the things, the possessions, the, the resources, the assets that we have are held commonly by the two of us. But there are a lot of ways in which we have to hold things in common. We have to really use intentional action in our lives to hold our calendars together. Especially now that our children are, are becoming older and have more and more activities. Um, it's important for us to communicate and to be intentional about making sure that we hold that part of our lives together. We have to work at it. We have to work at our individual relationship with all those people living under the same roof in our household, it's almost inevitable that there will be times that we're so consumed with all the activities of the children's lives that we forget to pay attention to each other and to make sure that we know what's going on in the other's heart and mind. That's something that requires intentionality to hold that part of our marriage together. And I hope we hear that example from the early church. Because Let's not forget that by this point in the passage, we have moved from a group of people who had a lot in common, 120 original followers of Jesus Christ. Earlier in the chapter, we learned that most of them are from Galilee, the same area. They've had a similar background. They've walked with Jesus for a few years, so they've had a similar life experience. But by this point in the story, after the Holy Spirit has fallen and they have shared the good news of Jesus and others have heard it from a variety of lands in a variety of languages. We're led to believe that this church that's being described late in Acts chapter 2 is made up of the 120. Plus all of those people from different lands with different languages, with different experiences, with different backgrounds. And all of those people together are the ones that are being described as holding all things in common. That is remarkable to me. And as I imagine how they held all things in common, one thing has emerged in my thought that I think is a, a helpful lesson for us in 2021. If you and I were going to hold all possessions in common and sell them and, and use the proceeds for each other's needs as they arose, one thing that would need to change in our mindset is we'd have to see each other almost as family. Because it seems counterintuitive for us to be able to pool our resources with a bunch of strangers and to care for people we barely know. We'd have to see each other as being part of one family. And so the first thing that I see in this holding all things in common is that the primary identity, the primary identity that these people seem to have is their identity in Jesus Christ. It has become more important to them than all their other associations. And that's a place where I can grow in my life, and I imagine many of us can grow in our lives. Stop for a moment and think about the ways in which you introduce yourself to another person. Lots of times we introduce ourselves associated with a place. I'm Jonathan, and I am from Maryville, Tennessee. Or if I'm meeting someone here in Maryville, I'll say, I'm Jonathan, and I'm originally from Abingdon, Virginia. So sometimes we associate ourselves with place, but then sometimes we associate ourselves by relationship. These days, it's not at all uncommon that I introduce myself and say, I am Grace's, Brett's, Micah's, Sage's, or Josie's dad. Or we might associate ourselves with what we do. I'm Jonathan. I'm the senior pastor at First United Methodist Church. And you might do that in association with your job, or with how you invest your time. You might associate yourself with one of the things that's dear to your heart in which you give of yourself as a member of an organization, as a person who is an office holder in some sort of committee or board. So we do that in a variety of ways. How often do you stick out your hand to someone and say, hi, I'm Jonathan, and I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe we have that foremost in our minds, but maybe we have allowed that to slip down a notch or two in terms of our prioritization of our relationships in our lives. 
Sometimes we'll talk about our salvation as an eternal life insurance policy. Maybe sometimes we allow our relationship with Christ to become like our relationship with our life insurance provider. We know that we have a secure policy. It's tucked away in the file cabinet or in the drawer, and we hardly ever refer back to it until the policy expires. And so I would never, ever introduce myself to someone by saying, I'm Jonathan, I'm a customer of my life insurance company. So it doesn't occur to us if that's the nature of our relationship. But if we have a living, dynamic, day-to-day involved relationship with Jesus Christ that we're really investing ourselves into just as easily and as quickly as it flows off of our tongues to introduce ourselves in terms of our relationships to our family or to our home or to our primary involvements, maybe it would occur to us just as easily to identify ourselves by our involvement in our relationship with Jesus. But less important than our introduction to others, how do we see ourselves? How do you feel yourself consumed in thought, in plan, maybe even in worry? Do you find that most of your time is spent thinking about that work or about that family? And very little time is allotted for thinking about the relationship with Christ? Or are you prioritizing? And in the same way that we do that in our relationships, are you being willful, intentional, and self-disciplined about maintaining the strength of your relationship with Jesus? That's the first thing that I see in this example. That it begins with the strength of each person's identity in Jesus Christ. But just as Jesus always consistently says, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, Jesus always consistently associates that commandment with a second, which he says is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And there's another act of intentionality, of willfulness, of self-discipline that's at work in this group of believers as they hold all things in common. As we read the Gospels of Jesus Christ, not only does Jesus pronounce how important it is to love neighbor as self, but we actually see Jesus exemplifying that willingness to broaden a concept of exactly who is my neighbor. I challenge you to read those four Gospels and to compare Jesus with some of the other characters and maybe particularly the Pharisees. In fact, it's more appropriate to say contrast Jesus with the Pharisees and realize that the Pharisees have really, really good intentions. Their intention is to make the people of Israel holier in God's eyes, to restore the nation and the faith of Israel by asking the people to live to a higher standard of keeping the law of God. In the process, however, they tend to narrow the people's conception of who's acceptable in God's eyes. They fuss at Jesus all the time because they think he's doing the kinds of things that sinners would do, and they call him to something greater. And at the same time, They're being exclusive of those that they identify as sinners. But see the example of Jesus, how he's the one who's willing to go across the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee to a foreign land, which means it's full of Gentiles, in the presence of a man who's filled with demons, which means that the Pharisees would not want to be anywhere around him, in a cemetery, which means it's an unclean place, filled with pigs, which means it's a doubly unclean place. Jesus goes into that place to show compassion, showing that he sees that man as neighbor when most of the others would see that man as someone they should not be around. There's an exclusivity, but Jesus is trying to build bridges. And we see him step into the land of the Syrophoenicians and into the land of the Samaritans. And we see him step into the homes of tax collectors and sinners And welcome them to his table. Jesus is always broadening the concept of who a neighbor ought to be. And how a neighbor ought to be loved. Where others seem to narrow it consistently. Maybe there's a challenge for us in the world today. I know it's a place in which I could grow. Because it's hard for me to look at people who don't share my values. 
Those people with whom no one would introduce me and say, I think you all have a lot in common. But those people that others would look at and say, you don't have much in common at all with them. It's difficult sometimes to see that person with a heart full of love because we all love to feel that we're right. And if we're right and we're so vastly different from someone else, we can have that perspective sometimes of the Pharisee and say, that person must be wrong. But that's not Christ-like. Not only that, I have to remind myself consistently that the proper name Satan literally means the obstacle, the one who gets in the way. If I'm unable to look at a person with love, at that moment in my life, Satan is victorious and not Jesus. So it requires willful, intentional, self-disciplined behavior on my part to love people. And that's true not only in the world around us, but it's true in the church around us. The first time the church experienced a major division, about a millennium after the lifetime of Jesus, the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox split apart from each other in Rome and Constantinople. The Romans spoke Latin. The Orthodox spoke Greek. Each chose a name for itself in the language of the other to stick it to the other. The Orthodox chose their name from a Latin phrase, orthodox, which means right belief. Can you imagine that? Ha ha, we've got the right belief over here. The Romans chose a Greek phrase, kataholika, which means Catholic in English. Uh, it means universal. And they said, well, you might think you got the right belief, but we're the universal church and do you see that, how not Christ-like it is? And aren't we tempted sometimes to do that now? Oh, since then, the, the body of Christ is splintered and fragmented and broken. Don't we sometimes spend more time worrying about what the Baptists are doing than worrying about how we can share love with the world around us? If I'm not careful, I can look at what another church is doing and feel a little jealousy I feel a little sense of resentment. They're not doing it right. Doesn't that sound like I've got the right belief over here? Shouldn't I be more excited that there are lots of people out there making disciples of Jesus Christ? That'd be a great time for someone to say amen. Amen. <laughs> and isn't it the case, too, that we can do that within the church? Every four years, I experience the periodic heartbreak that we can almost see our friends and neighbors ride into church, either on the back of a donkey or an elephant. That we can see people start to experience resentment toward each other, not only in the larger community, but within the body of Christ. Maybe because we hold those sentiments and attachments more dearly at that moment than we do our attachment to Christ or our attachment to people. Maybe one of the things that becomes really easy for us to do is to become splintered and fragmented within the body of Christ because we cease to see each other as people and we start to see them only as ideologies. I once heard a, a leader in the church say, the decision to divorce is easy. The process of divorce is always hard and messy. We usually make those decisions within the body of Christ based on ideology or based on idea we usually grieve those decisions because of people John Wesley years ago produced a beautiful work called the Catholic Spirit and he wasn't talking about the Roman Catholic Church from a moment ago he was Protestant to the core he saw lots of things in the practices of the Roman Catholic Church that he thought needed to be reformed. So he wasn't talking about Roman Catholicism, but he was talking about that meaning, the universal spirit. And he said this, Every wise man, therefore, will allow others the same liberty of thinking which he desires they should allow him, and will no more insist on their embracing his opinions than he would have them insist on his embracing theirs. He bears with those who differ from him and only asks him with whom he desires to unite in love that single question. Is thy heart right as my heart is with thy heart? Which is a question of love. The lesson I take from this verse is that love will make you do strange things. Love will make you 
intentional and willful and self-disciplined about the ways in which you identify yourself in the love of Jesus Christ and about the ways in which you hold all things in common with your fellow disciples in Jesus Christ, with those whom you love and call neighbors, and with those whom you have not yet met who might be your neighbors. Amen.